When SPC holds meetings in English and French on conventional equipment, the interpreters receive good sound and this helps them in their work. But today, the event will be going out in remote mode over Zoom. We would kindly ask you to remember a few tips to help us make the meeting go ahead as smoothly as possible. Set up a place to work from without any background noise as much as possible, preferably no other people around, roosters crowing or dogs barking. Use a headset with a built-in microphone for good sound quality and avoid speaking from a distance straight to your laptop microphone in a crowded room. You must select the English or French interpretation channel to be able to join in. To rename yourself, please right-click on your name in the participants window. Rename yourself per the meeting protocols advised as necessary. Keep your microphone muted and your video off at all times when you are not speaking. If you are entitled to and wish to speak, please click the raise hand icon in the reaction bar. Unmute your microphone when given the floor or wait for the meeting host to unmute you. Bandwidth permitting, switch your camera on while you speak. This will help the interpreters. You can also enter questions or comments in the chat window when invited to do so. In case of technical issues, please contact the meeting host via the chat function. If you're ready, let's get started. À la CPS, lorsqu'une réunion se déroule en anglais et en français au moyen des équipements habituels, les interprètes profitent d'une bonne qualité de sang, ce qui facilite leur tâche. Mais aujourd'hui, la réunion se tiendra en distanciel sur Zoom. Nous vous prions de bien vouloir suivre les quelques conseils suivants pour que la réunion se déroule aussi bien que possible. Participez à la réunion, si possible, dans un endroit sans bruit de fond, de préférence sans personne à vos côtés, coq qui chante ou chien qui aboie. Utilisez un casque avec microphone intégré pour une meilleure qualité de son. Évitez de parler dans une salle bondée à une certaine distance de votre ordinateur. Vous devez choisir un canal d'interprétation, soit anglais, soit français, pour pouvoir entendre. Pour vous renommer, veuillez faire un clic droit sur votre nom dans la fenêtre des participants. Renommez-vous en suivant le protocole établi pour cette réunion. Lorsque vous ne parlez pas, Veuillez systématiquement couper votre micro et votre vidéo. Si vous en avez le droit et que vous voulez prendre la parole, veuillez activer l'icône « Lever la main » en bas de l'écran. Branchez votre micro ou attendez que l'hôte de la réunion le branche pour vous. Si votre bande passante le permet, allumez votre caméra lorsque vous parlez. Cela aidera les interprètes. Vous pouvez aussi taper vos questions ou remarques dans le chat lorsque vous y serez invité. En cas de problème technique, veuillez contacter l'équipe informatique dans le chat. Vous êtes prêts Alors, allons-y Hello, Falava, and warm Pacific greetings to all our participants um, joining us online today. Uh, welcome to the third Pacific Ocean Decade Virtual Lab convened by the Pacific Community Center for Ocean Science. Today, we embark on an exciting Vaca Moana on a healthy and a resilient Pacific Ocean. My name is Shauna. I'm from Samoa, and I'm currently based here in Suva, Fiji. And it's an absolute pleasure to be a moderator for today's Vaca Moana program. Um, in case you, you might have missed the English um, version of our housekeeping, just a, a few uh, quick reminders again. Um, all those who are not going to be speaking will be on mute, so you won't be able to unmute yourself. 
Um, we'd very much like to keep today's uh, session as informal and engaging as possible. So again, we welcome you to post your comments and questions in the chat as we go throughout today's program. Um, there is live translation of this session in French. So um, at the bottom of your screen, you can see an interpretation um, icon where you can uh, select either English or the French translation. Um, again, welcome. And uh, if you're just joining us, uh, warm Pacific greetings. Um, now, before we get right into it, I would like to officially kickstart today's program with a short word of prayer. Okay. I close our eyes. Our dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this beautiful new day that has blessed us with and for the lives of all those joining us for today's program. We thank thee for the opportunity to gather together virtually through technology, to listen and learn from those who will be sharing their wealth of knowledge with us today. We invite thy spirit to be with us all, Father, as we embark on this learning journey, that we may actively listen, engage with one another, and be inspired by the work of our speakers today, so that we, as custodians of our Blue Pacific, may take both individual and collective action moving forward to ensure the sustainability of our shared ocean resources for the benefit of future generations to come. Father, we also remember at this time the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Tonga who are still recovering from the recent volcanic eruptions as well as those in war-torn countries. We pray for your healing mercies, peace and comfort to be upon them and all those affected. We humbly pray for all of these things and for your blessings over each and every one of us here today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for joining us um, and inviting the spirit to be with us as we embark on this learning journey. Um, and now I invite Dr. Graham Beely, head of the Oceanic Fisheries Program at SBC to provide his opening remarks. Welcome to Vaca Moana, a healthy and resilient Pacific Ocean. My name is Dr. Graham Pilling. I head up the Oceanic Fisheries Programme here at SPC in Numea in New Caledonia. This introduction is designed to give you a, a background on the fishery and what OFP does. The OFP is one of SPC's oldest programmes. It's been working since the 1970s to provide information for its members and more recently the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission or the WCPFC on scientific and technical information on the tuna and the fishery. The tuna fishery is of massive importance to the region. It provides employment, livelihoods and economic income for many of our members. That provides key resources such as roads, hospitals and schools so keeping the stock on which those fishery depends sustainable is very important to the region. The fishery is also of key importance globally. 60% of the world's tuna comes from this region. The catch itself has increased over time and in recent years we've had more than 2.5 million metric tonnes of tuna of the four stocks, skipjack, big eye, yellowfin and albacore caught in this region each year. The good thing is that our assessments suggest that all four stocks are currently exploited sustainably. So the key thing is to ensure that continues into the future. So how does SBC contribute to this endeavor? Well, we work in four general areas. We curate the region's fisheries data so ensuring the confidentiality and continuity of the information that's really important for a regional and mobile resource such as tuna. SPC also works closely with its members to understand the ecosystem within which tuna live. That includes our regional tagging programs, our biological sampling and our ecosystem surveys. This gives us an understanding of the health of the ecosystem in general, 
the biology of the tuna that are being exploited and can also inform our studies of the potential impacts of climate change. This all feeds into the scientific analyses and stock assessments that we perform that underpin the scientific advice that we provide to our members, our sub-regional management groups and also the Western Central Pacific Fishery Commission to help ensure the sustainability and the sustainable exploitation of the tuna stocks. And finally, we work with all our members to build their capacity to ensure that they can contribute to the information being developed and fully utilize it within their management discussions. That's enough for me. Thank you very much for joining us on this panel and I'll hand over to our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Pilling, for that uh, brief and uh, insightful introduction to the amazing work being done by the Oceanic Fisheries Program, or OFP, at SBC. As some of you may be aware, this event is part of the Global Ocean Decade Campaign by IOC, or the Intergovernmental Oceanographic uh, Commission of UNESCO. And every month, events are organized globally with the same theme um, by IOC. The Pacific Community or SBC have participated in two previous Pacific Ocean Decade Laboratories on inspiring and engaging ocean and a predicted ocean. This third Pacific Ocean Decade Lab is on healthy and resilient oceans, will mobilize scientists from SBC's fisheries, aquaculture and marine ecosystems uh, or FAME, the FAME division and end user of science products around a healthy ocean where marine ecosystems are mapped and protected. The main objective of today's virtual lab is to showcase the variety of activities that we in the Pacific through SBC, its members and partners are, are carrying out in support of the increasing of increasing the understanding, protection, and sustainable management of our marine ecosystems and resources. As Dr. Pilling had mentioned, such as monitoring tuna stock and ecosystem health in partnership with uh, its members through the S uh, WCPFC or the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, uh, region's tuna tagging program and tuna biological assembly program, to name a few. Uh, providing regional stock assessments, scientific analysis, and advice to support evidence-based fisheries management, um, and member countries providing their fisheries data to SBC's data management team, uh, which underpins a lot of SBC's technical work and advice, and finally, um, building the capacity of its membership in all these areas. So if you're in academia from a crop agency and early career oceans professional, uh, a climate and oceans activist or an aspiring fishery scientist, you're in the right place. As soon you will hear from four amazing scientists involved in cutting edge science that has made SBC one of the world's leading scientific organizations. Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce our four speakers joining us from SBC's HQ in Nomea, New Caledonia. First, we have Jed McDonald who is a senior fisheries scientist uh, with SBC. A key part of Jed's role is to answer the big question on tuna biology and ecology across the Pacific through studies integrating fishery data, uh, genetics, fish autoliths or ear stones and statistical modeling. The outcomes of these studies then feed into the regional tuna stock assessment models developed by SBC, which helps inform tuna management strategies across the region. Our second speaker is Valeria La, uh, who is also another uh, senior fishery scientist, and she works on Pacific tropical tunas and their pelagic ecosystem, conducting work at sea, in the lab, and performing data analysis to better understand the functioning of the pelagic ecosystem. This information supports models that can simulate the impact of fisheries and climate on tuna and other large pelagic predators. Valerie, um, some of you may be aware, also set up the first Pacific Marine Specimen Bank um, and has been with SBC for more than 20 years and have seen a lot of improvement over those uh, decades. Next, we have Sam McKechnie and Marina Oteau-Wichman, both fishery scientists, 
whose roles at SBC relate to providing scientific advice to member countries on options to sustainably manage the pelagic fisheries in their EECs and at regional level. So this involves several work strands, including responding to individual country requests, contributing to regional and sub-regional workshops and working groups, as well as assisting the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency with science support and providing capacity building to member countries. And finally, we also have Tuilen Dua, um, who you can see busy there scribbling away. To spend most of his time in science class drawing um, lots of funny pictures and this is what he will be doing for us today. He has been a professional cartoonist in the Pacific for over 10 years and has somehow ended up on this scientific panel. Uh, he will try and interpret what is discussed today with illustrations um, and Tui is also based in Nomea working as a graphic artist for publications at SBC. Um, so as we heard from Dr. Pilling, um, a lot of the work that SBC is carrying out wouldn't be possible without the collaboration with other crop agencies um, to help protect and maintain a healthy and resilient Blue Pacific. Uh, and the importance of tuna uh, in our uh, Pacific economies is evident in all the infrastructure that has been um, you know, uh, funded and uh, provided uh, through um, through all the the, the uh, income from that each country uh, received from tuna as uh, tuna in the Pacific. Um, you know, in the provides more than uh, fifty percent of the global uh, tuna supply. So um, we play a, a big a part in uh, the management of this very important shared resources across the Pacific. And before I hand over to our uh, panelists to provide further information about uh, the work that they do at OFP, um, I'd like to now um, let you uh, play, watch a, a video on tuna uh, management. Uh, that which provides a high level of view of uh, what we'll be covering in today's session. The Pacific Ocean is 48% of the world's ocean. In this ocean area, the Western and Central Pacific is a key region for tuna. Over half of the global total tuna catch is taken in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. Key tuna species in the region are skipjack, big eye, yellowfin and albacore. In 2019, the total catch of these four key tuna species in the convention area of the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, the region's fisheries management organization, was a record high at just under 3 million metric tons. The WCPO is currently the only ocean region with all four key tuna species in a healthy state, being neither overfished nor experiencing overfishing. Over 55% of the key tuna catch comes from within the waters of the Pacific Island countries and territories, and many of these countries rely on the continued sustainability of the tuna stocks to obtain important national income and employment opportunities for their people. Also, some countries have a strong and increasing reliance on tuna as a source of protein. The percentage of Perseners flagged to Pacific Island states has increased steadily for 20 years and now represents almost 50% of Perseners licensed to fish in the WCPFC convention area. For decades, the Pacific community has provided tuna science expertise in the Pacific region by providing regional stock assessments, scientific analysis, and advice to support evidence-based fisheries management. Monitoring tuna stock and ecosystem health in partnership with its members through the WCPFC region's tuna tagging program, vessel and observer log sheets, and tuna biological sampling programs. Member countries provide their fisheries data to SPC's data management team to underpin SPC's technical work and advice, building the capacity of its membership in all these areas. For over 40 years, the Forum Fisheries Agency has been supporting its Pacific Island members to take collective and national action for the management of their offshore fisheries resources. 
FFA works to ensure its members can enjoy the greatest possible social and economic benefits from the sustainable use of offshore fisheries resources. This has been delivered by innovative fisheries management and legal advice to help countries secure the rights to the fishery resources and manage the tuna stocks within their 200-mile exclusive economic zones. Combating illegal, unregulated and unreported IUU fishing through cutting-edge technologies and regional surveillance operations. Economic data and analysis to support countries to maximize economic returns and enhance social benefits. Facilitating regional cooperation and solidarity to support Pacific Island countries to work together to protect and benefit from the sustainable use of their tuna resources. Through cooperation and solidarity, FFA member countries are working together to protect the region's tuna stocks and secure benefits for current and future generations. The WCPFC is the organization in charge of determination of the regional total allowable catches or total levels of fishing effort, adopting conservation and management measures, adopting standards for collection, verification and timely exchange of data, compiling and disseminating accurate and complete statistical data. The members of the PNA control 50% of the global supply of skipjack tuna, the most commonly canned tuna. The focus of PNA efforts to sustainably manage tuna is the Vessel Day Scheme. PNA members agree on a limited number of fishing days for the year, based on scientific advice about the status of the tuna stocks. Fishing days are then allocated by member country EEZ and sold to the highest bidder. In this way, Pacific Islanders reap economic benefits from their sustainable management of tuna. This high-quality science, advice and support and the member country's commitment has resulted into effective evidence-based fisheries management decision-making. For the future, continued proactive management of the stock based on the best available scientific advice is needed to ensure the continued sustainability of the stocks and fisheries and the benefits derived from them. Um, yeah, so as, as that video uh, highlighted, um, our tuna stocks in, in the Pacific region are, are pretty healthy. And we'd love to know, um, you know, the science behind, you know, the, the, the science that's gone behind, you know, coming up with these um, analysis and through um, stock assessments and the works um, that the SBC team have been working on, um, starting with the, with the tuna tagging program. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Valerie and Jed, if you could um, perhaps shed a bit more light on how the tuna tagging program is being carried out uh, at SBC. Thanks very much, Shona. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I think I speak on behalf of my fellow panelists to say it's a, it's a privilege to be sitting on the panel here this morning, and um, I'm really excited for the upcoming discussions and your questions. So, yeah, as Shauna mentioned, we're first going to talk a little bit about SPC's long-running tuna tagging program. And um, tuna tagging has been a core part of um, the SPC's Oceanic Fisheries Program um, since the late 1970s. So the large-scale tagging experiments provide the key data that uh, we need for the regional tuna stock assessments. And these data include things like uh, fishery exploitation rates, the mixing of population and the actual size of the population. In fact, to date, uh, we have now tagged over 1 million tuna since the tagging program began. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a flavor about how these tagging cruises occur and what happens in the excitement that happens on board, um, we'd like to play a little video now um, to, uh, to guide you through it. Okay, so <clears throat> this video was taken in, in PNG uh, in Papua New Guinea uh, in collaboration with the uh, National Fisheries Agency uh, authorities over there. And it's a program um, that um, ran into 2012. 
So here you can see a picture on the on the bow of the boat. There's a tagging cradle and the tags that we use to uh, insert in the fish. So the fishermen are, are watching for the fish. They use binoculars to try and identify the school fish. And uh, here we've got we see the, the fish master ringing the bell to indicate there's a there's a fish school. So you just saw before some little fish swimming around in a in a in a bucket. Um, these are the bait that, that uh, on the pole and line cruises um, that are used to attract the fish to the boat. So the fishermen are, are getting ready at, uh, at the bow and uh, here we've got the, the bait master who's throwing the baits to attract the tuna that were seen previously. Okay, so action's about to get underway here. Um, it gets pretty frenetic at times up on the bow and you can see there's about 10 to 15 guys fishing here. Um, the bait gets continually thrown into the water and um, as the fish come up on board, they're escorted to the tagging cradle where the, where the business starts. So yeah, the, we've got the catchers who, uh, who de-hook the fish and bring them to the table. And here uh, the fish is measured and tagged and thrown back into the water. And it takes really a few seconds to, uh, to send the fish back into the water. Uh, so yeah, just more action here from a different angle. And you can see the fish coming on like often really quickly, it, depending on the size of the schools, there can be um, all the rods can be buckled at the same time with fish coming on board and um, it gets pretty hectic at times. So those, those cruises are really organized purely for the tagging. So a real fishing boat would, would uh, bring the fish back on board much, much faster than that. So we have two cradles here at the front, at the bow of the, of the boat. And there are also two cradles at, at, the, at the back of the boat to, uh, to tag as many fish uh, as we can. So as Val said, this is um, down at the stern, the back of the boat and it's a smaller space down there and um, often the the action is not quite as fast and furious uh, but it's also a place that we can do a few more things in terms of uh, different types of experiments on board some biological sampling and um, that just adds to the data that we can get from these cruises So yeah, this is um, just to provide you a bit of context in terms of the area that's covered by the tagging cruises. As you can see on the map, um, the tagging experiments have been conducted widely across the Pacific. These are vessel tracks um, from all the different cruises that SPC has been involved with since the late 1970s. Um, and their different colors there represent the different parts of the ocean where the boats have been traveling and we've been doing tagging. Um, the first large scale conventional tagging experiment began in 1977 and this ran until 1981. And uh, this was done under the Skipjack Survey Assessment Project. From, then from 1989 to 1992, the regional tuna tagging project took place. And that time, and that time um, these tagging cruises were, were more trying to provide snapshot assessments um, of the Skipjack and Yellowfin stocks. Um, but provided more in limited information on big eye tuna and South Pacific albacore. So then from 99, uh, 1999 through to 2003, SPC and CSIRO in Australia teamed up um, on an archival tagging project um, off the Coral Sea in Australia's Northeast, and that was focused on big eye tuna. And then in 2006, the first phase of the current program which is the Pacific Tuna Tagging Program um, began. And this was in Papua New Guinea and the Solomons. And this ran and through till two 2013 in the first phase. Since 2016, um, up until now, the, this um, Pacific Tuna Tagging Program has continued with annual tagging cruises, um, each year done either in the Western Pacific or in the Central Pacific although recent COVID restrictions have, have changed those plans a little bit. I'll talk about that um, in, a, in a little while. 
the tagging cruises are also um, give us a, also a big opportunity to do other stuff than just tagging. We do uh, biological sampling and we do also experiments. Uh, we've done like, recently experiments on how to best sample uh, genetic samples. Uh, we are doing um, studies on tuna growth um, and, and tuna movements. And all those experiments are providing different types of information. And those information really depends on the type of tags we're using. So what you've seen on, 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 the, um, on the video is basically uh, what we call a conventional tag. So I'm gonna try and show you even if it's what you see on the picture, it's a really small um, piece of plastic that, um, that uh, goes into the fish. And we have an applicator here and I'm going to demonstrate right now what we do, how we do that on, on my colleague. So Sam, thank you for being uh, my. And so we, we introduce the, the applicator into under the skin of the fish. And when we remove the applicator, the tag stays into the fish and half he goes back in the sea. So if you find Sam somewhere, bring it back. <laughs> but um, and so with those conventional tags, you can see on, on the map on the screen, we, can, we, have, uh, we know where we release the tag, we know uh, where the tag is recovered with uh, thanks to the fishermen who bring them back, and we can have an idea of long distances where uh, fish have been going. Uh, it helps us to understand the natural mortality of the fish, uh, their growth, their longevity, uh, their residency, and also the impact of, of fishing and, and, and the different interactions between, between the different types of fisheries. Um, at the bottom of the, of the picture, you see also another type of tag, which are archival tags. So they, these are much bigger. They are actually electronic devices that are surgically uh, implanted into the fish. And it has a probe that, uh, that's going to measure temperature, the depth, the light around the, the fish. And we can, with this information, uh, estimate where the fish has been going, but very uh, in, in, in very detail. And uh, we also, and this is a, the, the graph you see um, uh, on, the, on the bottom left, we can identify where the fish is going mainly to go feeding. And so on this graph, the gray parts are the night and the middle, the white band is the day and it shows the depth. So during the night, the fish are really close to the surface around 50 meter depth. And those are big eye tracks. And we see that during the day, they move down to around 300 to 400 meter depth. So it gives us a lot of uh, fine details on, on the tuna behavior. And this is also uh, important information when we want to um, implement mitigation measures to uh, try and avoid catching small fish, for example, or fish around fats. So this is... Uh, 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 the, the tagging is a really a source of, of different uh, of different information. So, um, I thought we'd just take one example of a, a recent cruise. Thanks, thanks, Pierre. Um, so we thought we'd just uh, take one example of a recent cruise just to to show you some of the numbers. Um, and the and the type of uh, area that's covered in this in these cruises. So this this is the um, WP five cruise, Western Pacific, the fifth Western Pacific cruise. It was conducted in two thousand and nineteen, and this boat in the in the picture here is the same one that you saw in the video before. So we're working closely with a local fishing company in the Solomon Islands on this cruise. And, and that's a key part of, of um, the success of these cruises is actually working with industry and um, engaging them in the science that we do. So this cruise was a fairly typical one. Um, it was done before COVID restrictions uh, made going to the Solomons very difficult. Um, but the, the cruise track, we left the Solomon Islands and we traversed um, waters in Papua New Guinea Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, the cruise took 59 days. So we were at sea for a while and there were several cruise changes. So people coming on and off and Val and I were lucky enough to be um, on that cruise for some parts of it. The cruise basically focuses on skipjack and yellowfin um, using conventional tags. And this is to try and 
as we as Val spoke about, to try and understand certain aspects of their biology and also provide the key inputs for the stock assessments. On this cruise, we also trialed some archival tagging in Skipjack for the first time. Uh, it was a pretty successful cruise, I think, given the given the the challenges that often they're often faced. Um, we had tagged over sixteen thousand fish and um, covered over six six and a half thousand nautical miles. So, as I said, uh, this was done before COVID, and cruises in the past two years have had a, a bit of a different um, focus uh, by necessity. We've uh, we've we've conducted two tagging experiments in the Central Pacific. Uh, these are focused on big eye tuna and predominantly big eye tuna uh, around fish attracting, fish aggregating devices or FADs. So archival tags have been a, a key component of this to try and understand the behaviour of the fish and how they associate with um, FADs, which are a very important tool for, for the fishing industry these days. Uh, the success of these cruises in the face of COVID-19 um, to me really speaks to um, the value of engaging industry and um, member member and, me and, and our members in developing, planning, and then running these types of tagging cruises. We had record numbers of fish tagged um, on both these these two recent cruises. So that's um, that was great work. So this year, all going well and and travel restrictions lifting, we're hoping to run another a cruise in the Solomon Islands. Um, a couple of SBC scientists are going and we're working uh, in collaboration with uh, the same fishing company that we've worked with in the past and also um, an in-country uh, fishery scientist who's going to join the cruise for some period. The cruise will run for six, about six weeks and it's planned sort of end of July, August to, um, to leave Noro in the Solomon Islands. So yeah, this information from this cruise, this up and coming cruise will be, will be critical for the 2025 skipjack assessment, which is the next on the roster for that species. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jed, and warm Pacific greetings all. Um, there was one important aspect that I thought might be useful to mention here, and you touched on it, and that's the importance of engagement with the industry. Now, we all know that the tagging cruises are, are, are critical when we look at understanding the, the behavior of the tuna, um, looking at gathering this important data and information that will feed into these stock assessments, and this is something that Sam will talk to um, later on in the presentation this morning. Um, but, you know, when we look at the industry engagement, it's important to understand that we, we need to ensure that everyone is aware of why it, why it is important and understanding that, you know, there are different interests. Of, obviously, from an industry perspective, it's ensuring that they can maintain their catches so that they generate revenue, they can generate jobs, ensure that there is a steady supply of food into the into whatever markets they're, they're targeting. And so there is common interest from both sides to ensure that there is a sustainable fishery for them to continue to catch fish. And to this end, SBC has been um, engaged in a number of initiatives. And as you had mentioned, we've been collaborating with our member states and the tuna industry from 20, um, 2006. And we've been looking at ways to strengthen the science, strengthen the way we engage with the industry um, in the Western Central Pacific Ocean. Now, the tag recovery is one of those success stories, and we've already he um, heard that over 1 million tag fish have been released. You know, it's a phenomenal amount. And really, that pays tribute to the hard work of engagement, uh, working with industry, but also working um, with our observers, working with our port inspectors, working with the vessel captains and industry themselves. So it, it's a great way, a great success story to see the types of um, work programs that SPC is um, working with our member states and also the industry. Um, so I understand now we're going to actually see um, or watch a video of one of the tag recoveries in action. So over to you, Pierre. The Pacific community over 15 years has tagged over 450,000 tuna, generating the largest tagging data set for tuna management globally. While 18% of tags have been recovered, the SPC is seeking help from those involved in the commercial fishing industries to return the thousands of tags that are yet to make their way back to base. 
We are facing a lot of challenge to have the tag returned to SPC. We have a very large area where we're working in, a very large fisheries, and it's extremely important for the tag to be reported and retrieved in port. So we've got tag recovery officers employed in ministry as well as industry that are meeting tag finders all around the region to provide reward, validate the data and collect the information. So the tags actually are talking to us. They give us basic information such as migration of the fish, where the fish has been caught, also give us a growth rate because people are measuring the fish so we know the lengths when they were released and the lengths when they were recaptured but also it gives us information about the fisheries impact how much fish are actually taken by by the fisheries um yeah Good, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so we've seen, um, we've heard from Jed and, and Val and, and Marina about the importance of this, this tagging data. Um, and I guess the, the, you can see that the enormous amounts of effort that, that people go to, um, you know, that everyone's, everyone's done to accumulate this data. Um, you can see on the screen there, some of the rewards that are given for people that report on, the, on these tags um, and the collaborations with the industry. But um, ultimately um, our section of, of, of OFP um, we, we end up using this data and we use it in the stock assessments and we'll talk about it in, in a bit. But um, just briefly, they're, they're very, very important data. In fact, um, you know, the, you've heard the numbers. Some of our stock assessments, we simply, we can't do without the, the tagging data. Um, so it's vitally important. And um, all these things, all these different strands that have gone into the tagging program um, seem to be working well, I think, um, COVID. Um, with the exception of the, the recent period, but hopefully we, we move forward now um, and continue this so that we can keep um, measuring the status of the stock with, with accuracy. So we're going to look at, at another aspect um, uh, that also um, uh, concerns uh, the tagging. So the tagging, as I mentioned before, is, is a good platform to also do um, uh, other stuff than tagging and, and biological sampling is part of it. So um, yeah, um, at SPC, we, since 2001, we have started collecting uh, biological samples of fish. Um, it started small and then with the years, uh, we established a great collaborations with the observer programs from uh, the, the Pacific, um, the national fishery services around in the Pacific countries. And uh, along the years, we trained uh, observers, we trained port samplers, and uh, with the years, the number of samples collected on fishing vessels, but also at port in canneries really uh, increased and to date uh, we have managed to uh, collect uh, more than 160,000 uh, sample of, um, of tuna mainly but also other large pelagic fish such as marlins or mai mai and you can see on this map uh, the spatial extent of, of this sampling from that started yeah about 20 years ago so it's really a collaborative work with uh, our um, colleagues from from the fishery services in in the pacific islands and and it's a it's a great asset for for spc and for the region and it's really supported by the western and central pacific fisheries commission who helps us to maintain this what we call the pacific marine specimen bank all the samples are gathered in freezers uh, in Yumea, in New Caledonia, but also in other locations. And um, all those samples are used by us uh, at SPC to, uh, to conduct some analysis, but also by, by other scientists from the region or from outside the region and to the interest uh, of the regions. And so those samples are made available to, um, to all the scientists and they can request to have access to, to the samples to conduct studies. And uh, Jed will give you a little bit more information on what are the, the samples we're collecting. So it's one of my favorite ever pictures. <laughs> this is one of my favorite ever pictures of a tuna, exactly how they look when they come in on the tagging cruise, a bit like this. Um, but it's a, it's a nice representation of uh, the types of samples that we collect. So depending on the species, um, the current data gaps that we have and um, where the fish is destined to go market-wise, 
um, we can collect different types of samples um, that all feed into the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank as well just discussed. So we normally routinely would collect the otoliths or the ear stones, which are in the, in the head of the fish. They're actually located in the inner ear um, and they're used to, uh, to look at fish age and growth as well as other applications. We also collect the liver, the stomach, the gonad to determine the sex, um, muscle samples, both for understanding like the tuna's position in, in the ecosystem, its trophic position, but also for genetic studies. And um, sometimes we also collect the blood and the first dorsal spine, which you can see it's like the front fin on the back of the tuna here. So we can use this um, for, for understanding age and growth as a nice comparison with otoliths. So I have um, a, a, mm. just a, a question um, that's been posted in the chat uh, before you are moving on. Um, so Chloe has asked uh, if there's been any attempts to tag albacore um, noticing that the, the, your presentation um, spoke to uh, speaks to tagging skip drag yellowfin and big eye tuna, and um, also just uh, I guess a follow up question in regards to the biological sampling, like uh, what happens with these samples after they've been collected and stored at your um, marine specimen bank? I mean, uh, I'll answer the albacore okay. question. Yeah, go for yeah. it. So there has been some albacore tagging. Um, albacore are my favorite tuna. Um, they're called the chicken of the sea. And many people here don't love albacore as much as me. Some, some even say they're not a tuna, but I believe they're the best tuna. Um, so efforts have been made to tag these animals, but because they're perhaps more intelligent than other tunas um, in the sea, they've been exceptionally hard to tag and we have very limited information at the moment from the tagging studies that have been done. So it's, um, it's always in our minds about getting some more tagging information on albacore, but just given the, the location of where the fish uh, are distributed and um, the difficulty in accessing um, good fish, good quality fish for tagging, it's been a challenge. It's on the agenda though. Um, you know, it's still a, still a point of discussion when we talk about tagging. Yeah, we'd, I think we had a, a tagging program a few years ago and uh, with very limited success. Uh, we're, yeah, I think in the numbers, we're closer to 2,000 fish tagged rather than uh, the mm. million of, of other tropical tunas. And yeah, as uh, Jed mentioned, it's they're difficult to access. They are fragile uh, animals and they don't survive well uh, manipulation. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a very challenging species to, to work with. And um, about the other question about how we're using the, um, the samples, we are um, um, doing um, um, different different types of studies. So on the on this picture, you you can see actually uh, people um, uh, butchering uh, nicely uh, some uh, some dolphin fish to uh, to collect so samples that will go into into the specimen bank. And we have been doing a, a, a different types of studies in collaboration, usually with uh, other colleagues from other institutions. And for example, on, on the map, um, you can see here, this is uh, the, the mercury concentration in skipjack tuna. Um, and so this is one uh, example of, of uh, the use we have been doing of the, of the samples collected in the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank. And, um, uh, we collaborated with the French Institute for Research uh, for um, uh, Sustainable Development on this job. And so um, the, the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank provided all the, all the samples that are uh, shown in blue here. And uh, we collaborated with other institutions in the region to have uh, a, a larger spatial coverage of the Pacific. Uh, what, what this um, map shows is that uh, um, we have spatial variability of, of mercury concentration in the fish. So all the skipjack don't have the same mercury concentration in the Pacific. Um, the lowest values are, are kind of located in the Western and Central Pacific. So it's pretty uh, good news for, uh, for our country members. 
and and we can see that there are higher values in the eastern pacific and and and, uh, and the highest values are, are found um, in close to asia and so this is a um, a great source of information for us so um and um, it gives us a better understanding of what's happening in the ocean when we compare con contrasted uh, areas or where things happen differently it helps us understanding how the things are, are actually working and we know um, and looking at the data from this map we uh, were able to understand that in the eastern pacific there is an oxygen minimum zone so there's poor oxygen into the ocean and it really disrupts the normal functioning of the ecosystem over there and it will increase the concentration of mercury into the ocean and then into the fish so this is um, a good source of, of information uh, for us we also um, have uh yep yeah, sorry shona yeah no it's just like fantastic to see the different applications um uh, that, um, you know, all this uh, data from your biological sampling and tuna tagging trips have on um, understanding different um, and the different sciences. And uh, there was a question from uh, registration um, about if there's been any studies done on microplastics in tuna and what have been, like, what were the findings, if, if any? Yeah, so microplastic is, is definitely a, a topic uh, that uh, many people start looking very seriously because it, it's, it's a real threat to the environment and to, uh, to our health. And um, we actually began uh, looking at microplastic in fish. Uh, we have um, a, a program uh, funded, funded by a um, um, French Pacific funds, and again in collaboration with uh, with other partners, other scientific um, institutes. We actually are starting next week uh, experiment in the lab to look at stomach content of uh, of tuna and see if we can find microplastic in those stomach contents. We are also analyzing um, fish muscle, tuna fish muscle. Um, we uh, we will compare New Caledonia and, and Papua New Guinea to uh, to see if we uh, kind of detect some uh, microplastics in muscles and in stomachs. So it's it's a work in progress. So unfortunately, we have no um, no results to to show yet. But this is the first experiment we are we are looking at to to see where we are and and potentially extend the study if uh, if we feel that uh, there's a need for it. So yeah, this is, and this is a great. Uh, um, opportunity given by the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank is when we have a, a scientific question, uh, we already have samples, or we can collect more samples to answer those questions. So it's a it's it's a great asset for for the region. And there are uh, other uh, other applications, and and Jed has been working on some too. You can see. Yeah, thanks, Val. Um, so we also do a variety of projects involving fish otoliths. Um, these are collected routinely and we've got a, a large archive uh, in the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank, um, mostly on tuna, but also on other coastal fish and, uh, and um, other pelagic species. So this is a, a picture of a skipjack tuna otolith. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty small. It's about, I would say, just over three millimetres at its longest. Um, and this is, these, cal these are calcium carbonate ear stones that sit in the inner ear of a, of a bony fish. And like a, like a tree, every day that the fish lives, a layer of uh, bone is deposited on the outside of these structures. So you can count those rings like tree rings. And this gives scientists an opportunity to, to work out the age of the fish and also to see how far the fish how fast the fish grows. So you can see here, these are just, um, you can see the rings here, like a, like a cross section through a tree trunk. Um, and the white dots here represent the daily increments. This is a skipjack tuna. And right in the core here, the, the core part, that's the day that the fish was born or hatched, shall we say. So you can look at the distances between these rings and you can work out how fast the fish grows and relate that to its actual body length. 
The other part of the work that we do, I mean, these are, these are really important aspects, both fish age and growth. These are key parameters for the stock assessment models. And um, a lot of the, the work we do on, on tuna otoliths involves age and growth. Yet there are other applications that we can, that we can look at using these structures. One of them is um, the chemistry that is contained within these calcium carbonate structures. So when the fish swims through different environments, um, it, the otolith actually incorporates the different concentrations of elements from the water into um, the structure of the, of the otolith. So we can measure those different elements. For example, one here I've put down is strontium and strontium reflects um, things like the environmental gradients in temperature and salinity, but it can also reflect the metabolism of the fish and the physiology. So in effect, if we can measure the, the chemical um, uh, environment through the otolith, it gives us a wonderful indicator to be able to understand where tuna move to, maybe how they're structured, how the populations are structured across the Pacific. And, um, and this also is key information uh, for, the, for the stock assessments, because we still have a lot of uncertainties around where to divide the, the regions for these models. And um, otoliths are another string to our bow in terms of being able to answer some of those um, open questions. Another part of the, of the work we have been uh, doing is, is monitoring uh, the ecosystem. And uh, and so um, and we're going to watch a, a small video to uh, kind of show you what what it implies. But it basically uh, really uh, relates to uh, to going at sea and actually uh, finding uh, you know or collecting samples uh, to, uh, to, con to conduct to um, measurements of what the ecosystem looks like. So. Yes, you should have this small video running. So uh, we, we go at sea on board uh, um, scientific vessels. Um, maybe in the future, SBC will have its, its own uh, fishing vessel or a scientific vessel. But for the moment, we are really collaborating with other research agencies. And this is uh, the ALICE. It's a, a French research vessel based here in New Mea, in New Caledonia. And uh, we are going on board this uh, small vessel with colleagues of, uh, of the French Institute of uh, Research for S Sustainable Development to um, actually go and, and do some uh, ecosystem surveys. So going in, uh, in the offshore seas, um, we have a number of instruments that we put in the water. Uh, we're gonna measure the temperature, the salinity uh, down to 600 meter depth. Uh, we are also uh, collecting um, water samples. So, um, and uh, it helps us understand what's, what's in the water, particularly uh, um, phytoplankton, but also all the nutrients. So um, here you can see we have um, uh, filtering, we are filtering the water to, to measure the phytoplankton. We also have uh, instruments such as uh, acoustic uh, that will allow us to see uh, the fish below the, the vessel. And we are particularly interested in the, in the small fish, which, um, which we call the micronectin. And uh, to, once we detect them on, on the acoustic screen, we, uh, we put them, the fishing gear uh, in the water. So it's a large uh, troll net that goes uh, 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 only pelagic nets. So it does not go close to the bottom. And uh, it seems big, but uh, uh, you'll see that the, the catch is pretty small. So. The, the captain is always desperate because we catch so so few fish but uh, for us scientists it's it's always a source of uh, of uh, interest and uh, and um, yeah it's it's always great to have the the samples coming back on board and those little uh, fish uh, squids uh, little um, um, shrimps and, uh, and gelatinous 
are basically um, the food of the tuna. So there's a large variety, diversity of, of specimens, and, and they, will, um, they will constitute the food of the tuna, and that's why we are particularly interested into that. So we are conducting studies. Uh, recently, uh, we went from New Caledonia uh, up to uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and we hope next uh, later this year to go from uh, French Polynesia to Kiribati to, uh, to collect this type of samples. I love seeing more women on those um, uh, scientists uh, cruise, <laughs> science cruises. Um, so we did have a question from uh, one of the registrants um, who asked, uh, what influence does mesopelagic species have on tuna fisheries? Um, it's obviously very important. So just for, for people who don't know, the mesopelagic fish are basically the fish that are uh, located between 200 meter depths and 1000 meter depth. So they are deep, uh, deep specimens. And um, I don't know if you remember uh, the, the graph I showed before. We see that, for example, the big eye tuna are diving as deep as three or 400 meter depth. So they are basically able to go and reach those lakes years where those uh, small mesopelagic fish are and and they basically constitute the food and we see that in the lab when we open uh, fish stomachs we uh, definitely see a variety of surface food but also deep food in 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 the stomach so it's the base of of their um of their diet the mesopelagic fish and, and other organisms are the base of the, of the diet of, uh, of tuna. And we're trying to understand better and, and try to model uh, how those, uh, those uh, small, um, what we call forage fish are influencing the, um, the large pelagic specimens and, uh, and trying to uh, kind of uh, estimate or, or assess if, if they're going to follow the food or not. So it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of work to do and uh, we have no definite answer, but um, yeah, still, still more work to, to be done on, on this, but definitely uh, an important part of, of the ecosystem of the pelagic ecosystem. One of the things that has really um, sort of uh, stood out from as you've um, been speaking towards the, the all the, the programs and the um, that you're doing at SBC is the importance of the collaboration with different partners. Um, I'm, I'm sure if it weren't for, you know, that um, collaboration, you know, a lot of the work wouldn't be possible. Um, and I think I'll, I'll give uh, Jed and Val a, a break and um, perhaps turn to uh, Marino and, and um, Sam uh, for a bit. Um, so one of the common assumptions that people have is that tuna in the Pacific are currently being overfished. Um, and this is where stock assessments performed by SBC may be able to shed some light on what is the on what the case is really. Um, but before I hand over to Sam and Marino uh, to tell us more about their stock assessment work, um, let's hear from Tiffany, another uh, SBC fishery scientist who responded to a similar question from Kyle in Marshall Islands on Teen Tuna Talk. Teen Tuna Talk. Yo, well, my name is Justin Kajamore. I'm from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And one of my questions for you is, since tuna is being overfished, what are some ways other than farming to prevent tuna from being extinct? Thank you. Although it's true that many of the tuna populations in the world are overfished, that's not the case for the Western and Central Pacific. In this region, all of the main tuna species are currently healthy and reasonably well managed. However, to ensure that the populations stay healthy, we need to collect information from the fisheries as well as from the tuna themselves. Better and more data will mean the scientists can understand better what's going on with the tuna populations and provide more accurate information to the people who are making decisions about managing tuna catches. Ensuring that, that tuna catches are sustainable is really the key to continuing to be able to harvest wild tuna. Over to you, uh, Sam and Marino. Uh, thanks, Shona. Um, 
Yeah, I guess for a bit of a change of topic, and it's always a bit awkward to um, to start presenting after these guys have done their thing as they gallivant around the around the ocean, tagging fish, chopping them up, and that type of thing. So we're moving on to, I guess, a bit bit more of a dour topic. Um, but maybe we'll spice it up a little bit. But um, yeah, so we're we're going to talk about stock assessments, um, which hopefully many many of you have um, have heard of. Um, and I guess this is one of the, the kind of core roles of, of OFP. We've got a team of probably 10 or more people that are working on this um, full time. Um, so I got a little slide up here, um, a little graphic, and basically a stock assessment at its most basic is, is how we measure the health of a, of a tuna population or a tuna stock. Um, and, and by health, I kind of mean um, answering pretty simple questions like how many fish are there out there? Um, how has this changed over time? How much impact have we had? How much impact has the fishing had? And um, what might happen in the future under, under a number of different things, climate change and that type of thing. Um, and so to answer these things, we use this, this so-called stock assessment, which is basically um, computer models and, and um, uh, computer programming and things like that which we won't go into, but basically what they have is, is some inputs. And we've heard, we've already heard from um, Val and Jed about some really essential things that go in. So the biology, we get the growth rates from these guys, um, the, you know, how, how old are fish when they mature, um, knowledge of the structure of the stock, um, how they move around. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is take all the information that we have available, the, the, the best kind of knowledge that we have and, um, develop these models that that mimic what's happening in the actual ocean so we know we know what's going on um, and so we've heard about the biology but one of the other really important things is is data um, is, is a key ingredient I guess you'd say and um, we're actually pretty lucky in the Pacific compared to some other oceans where there's been a really long history of, of, of pretty good data um, data collection and management um, for, for many decades, there's been a lot of effort put into developing um, data standards and the minimum requirements for data that, that certain countries have to provide us. Um, yeah, and um, for certain countries, I guess we're, we're, we're receiving data from, from certain countries, and this would be along the lines of um, their domestic vessels, um, you know, in New Caledonia, New Cal Caledonian vessels um, sending data to us. Um, in other countries, there will be domestic vessels and it'll also be foreign vessels um, fishing in their EEZs. Um, so we, we assist members in, in the data collection and the management. Um, they typically provide data for us to in integrate into, into kind of regional databases. So we're, we're kind of working in partnership with them rather than being a repository. Um, and we manage that, that partnership with, with all our member countries. Um, and I guess an important thing to, to note over time and which we'll discuss in a second is um, in recent times or over the last couple of decades there's been a, a huge shift in, in what's happening with this data. Um, back in the day, SBC was manually entering a lot of the data as we received it via post. And um, there's been a big shift now where we have in each country, we have whole teams of really excellent data managers that are, that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting now. Um, and there's been a lot of work on the data management systems and themselves. So I'll pass over to, to Marino to, to talk about this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sam. And I guess it's important to maybe point out another function of OFP is um, we actually serve or um, we provide um, the services of data repository for our member states. And this is really important. And you, you touched on some of the data standards that uh, we collaborate we, with, um, with our member states. We're collaborating with other regional organizations to ensure that a lot of this data that we're receiving from, from our member states is, is accurate, it's timely, um, and can be um, really useful when we're inputting this into the stock assessment. Now, to date, um, SBC has developed a number of um, e, e applications um, to assist its member state countries in ensuring that this data is collected, um, obviously in a timely manner, but also it's in a format um, that has been agreed to by uh, um, 
student um, standard standards that have um, been set up by the Western Central um, Tuna Commission. Um, and so this really is important for ensuring that we have a, a, a clear idea about um, how our, our catches are training over time, how our fishing effort is, um, is going, and it allows us to better, I guess, quantify um, these things. Um, and obviously this is important when we look at trying to establish um, catch estimations to give, give a clearer picture of where the fishery is at at any one time. Um, obviously this data is important for also um, local fishing communities, it's important for the industry, um, as it provides that important information when we look at fishing trends over time. Um, you know, when we look at anchor fads around our local communities, are we catching more fish? Are we catching less? Are they bigger? Are they smaller? These are the types of things that we um, continuously hear from um, communities, hear from our member states. The difficulty is, of course, when you're at the national level, is you hear these complaints, you hear these issues, but there isn't any data, I guess, um, sometimes to support your justification to uh, get additional resourcing to assist or, you know, address any particular issues. As many states um, around the region, many governments use evidence-based information to determine how they make decisions. And so, which is why it's important that we are collecting this, um, this data and information. And so a new approach that SBC has been doing um, over a number of years now is transitioning from the old analog paper-based systems. Um, sorry, Jed, if you, yeah, that's the one, thanks. Um, old analog paper-based systems um, and transferring this into uh, electronic format. So it's a lot easier for our fishery officers, uh, for vessel captains, um, for our, our observers to be in an environment where in, in the Pacific, we know it's quite hard to have um, connectivity um, all the time. So these applications have been uh, tailored to ensure that they're, they're fit for purpose in, in the regions. And it, it's really nice. Again, a nice example of the collaboration SBC does with, it, with its member states. Um, and we have a pretty neat uh, image here. Um, I believe this was taken back in 2009. Um, and what you're seeing is observer logbooks, um, individual logbooks for individual trips on person vessels. And 2009 was an important year because that's when we are. Uh, the region decided that we were going to have 100% observer coverage on all per se um, fishing vessels in the region. So this just gives you an indication of the, the volume of data that SBC, its member state countries are generating and having to deal with. And to this day, um, the observer logbooks are manually entered uh, here. Um, and also there are some countries that are having, uh, who have dedicated um, data entry personnel for that. Now it's important to um, also note with these new applications, it's it's really allowed national administrations to to I guess further advance a lot of their technical staff. We're moving away from data entry um, personnel to upskilling them to actually what is the data telling us, data analytics, um, and so you know there, there is all these uh, kind of um, underlying benefits to moving to this this electronic format, um, which. I have to say it has been really successful. I mean, a, a lot of my fishery colleagues and administrations, they're at the day and age where they've grown up with this type of technology. And so, you know, utilizing that, that type of knowledge base, so utilizing the technology to enhance the, the types of work that our fishery administrations are undergoing, is, it's really it's really cool space to be in. Um, I did want to, quickly touch on some examples uh, within at the national level. Now, prior to my time at SPC, I, I was, I was uh, with the Cook Islands Ministry of Marine Resources in the capacity of the data manager. And in the Cooks, our legislation, like many in the region, um, there was a mandatory requirement that all uh, commercial operational log sheets would be um, transferred back to the administrations to be collected and also verified. Now, back in the day in 2017, um, the Cook Islands had vessels which were on, offloading at various different ports. We had vessels in Pango Pango, American Samoa, Suva, Fiji, and Papaete in Tahiti. And so obviously there was a logistical constraint in ensuring that we got those uh, paper log sheets couriered back to the ministry so it could be verified and entered into the databases. 
obviously you can imagine <laughs> there were some issues that we, we experienced where the um, log sheets were incomplete. Uh, sometimes uh, the handwriting was just so terrible you couldn't actually understand what the captain had been um, kind of entering. Um, and so we there was a bit of back and forth and you know this really did kind of hinder um, our ability to ensure that we um, were able to collect, verify into this data but also analyze it and to ensure that we were reporting um, to meet our annual um, deadlines. And so Everyone will know in the, in the region that you have national obligations, but you also have regional obligations. Your mem member states have signed up to certain conventions and agree that you know, your annual cash estimates will be delivered by a certain time. Um, so it's, it's really important that you, you have this, this information uh, readily available. It also um, has the potential to really either enhance or undermine some of the systems, uh, fishing systems uh, that different member states have adopted. For example, in the Cooks, we run a quota management-based management system for longline fishery, and um, this extends to um, Albacore and Pinkai. And so it, it really is important that we are um, ensuring that we have timely uh, catch information to ensure that vessels or um, or companies who have purchased um, quota aren't overshooting this, um, and which is why uh, applications, um, e-applications, have been quite critical in ensuring the integrity of those types of systems. Um, one other thing I do want to mention was, uh, I think it was back in 2017, um, SBC had just launched its artisanal e-application and um, tails. And this was focused on the artisanal fishery. Uh, and the Cook Islands was quite <laughs> fortunate to be um, one of the, the guinea pigs, I, I guess. Um, so there was a bit of um, trial and error with that. But we did see that there was a positive uptake. It allowed us to um, capture a lot of this information in really isolated communities. Um, islands or catch information we weren't receiving for years on end because it was just so hard and so difficult to transmit that data. Now we were receiving it in real time. Um, and so there were, you know, that, that was just a, a great success story. We were able to implement a fuel subsidies program, um, which encourages um, the submission of data um, to the local authorities. And in exchange, um, fishermen were given rebates or um, certain um, subsidies on their fuel. Uh, so no, I just thought I would share some of the, um, I guess, good stories uh, from the national um, level. And um, I think we're on management advice now, Sam. Yeah, so obviously um, there's a lot of effort that goes into, into firstly the, the, the biological sampling and, and um, that type of data, but also the, from the countries um, and, and all manner of different data collection. And so once we've got that biology, once we've got the, the data, we build our assessment models. Um, we then complete the assessment and, it, and, and, and it's presented to managers. Um, and from that, they can deliberate on how they want to react to, to the stock status. Um, and so stock assessments are very complicated. And obviously we're not gonna go into details today, but if you boil it down to um, the bare necessities, basically what you end up with is, a, is an overall kind of measure of the status of the stock, how healthy it is. And um, you can see on the slide, and, and anyone that's been in the region for any length of time will have seen this green, what we call the green finger many times, um, this one on the right. And um, it's showing a lot because um, people of the region are, are justifiably proud of the current status of their stocks, which, which are pretty healthy overall. Um, compared to some other oceans. Um, so basically, SBC goes, does their, their, their stock assessment and comes up with some, some measures of how healthy the stock is. This is presented to the managers at a scientific committee meeting every year in August. And um, the job of that body is to assess the science, um, make some conclusions about the stock, and that's kind of where you end up with this green finger. And then um, they pass on their recommendations to, to the managers themselves. Um, so this advice flows through to, to later in the year, there's another body. Um, this is the Western Central Pacific Fishery, Fisheries Commission um, Commission meeting. 
Um, this is the one where they make all the rules. Um, so I guess the, the overall role of that, that body is to decide what the rules of the, of the region, uh, the tuna fisheries are gonna be for the next um, certain amount of time. Um, and so if, if we were to present a stock assessment that said um, things are looking really bad for a certain species, that, that management um, is gonna to have to come up with some type of um, intervention to, to fix things, make things better. Um, and so it's a really hard thing um, and it's very hard. There's a lot of hard negotiations at these meetings about what, what we might do. Um, so this next slide um, is showing something slightly different. So the last one, we, we're looking at the status of the stock and it's got a kind of traffic light system of, of green, orange, and red. Um, but just because we're in um, a, a fairly healthy state now in the Pacific doesn't mean we can necessarily keep increasing catches or, or, or perhaps even maintain our catches. So what this slide shows is a few of the species and a kind of a little um, barometer type thing that says, you know, whether, whether we can increase, maintain or, or reduce the catches of some of these stocks. So this is what the managers kind of have to um, the, the, the kind of end game of what the managers have to decide is, is how we're going to deal with these species, um, what catches should be in, in, the, in the future. So you can see a couple of um, our important stocks there, yellowfin and um, skipjack, which are in healthy states. Um, the general consensus is it would be nice to maintain or stabilize those catches. Whereas another one like albacore is, um, even though it's in a pretty healthy state at the moment, there's, there's a desire from a lot of members to um, actually reduce these catches because it's not as economically um, advantageous to have them at, at a lower level. So um, these are some of the issues that they have to deal with. Um, and so these types of things, these decisions to cut catches or, or even to put limits on are extremely difficult. And um, if anyone's been to any of the meetings or, or read any of the press releases, a lot of time is spent um, I, I guess you could say arguing or, or negotiating um, who's going to do what. Um, so it's a difficult process, but I think it's fair to say there's been um, enormous strides over the years and there's been some big wins. Um, and one of the mo most famous that we've seen in an earlier video is the, the limits on the Perth Seine fishery, which is very important. Um, but just uh, next slide, Jen. Um, just one example, um, a specific example of how this might be, be in, um, implemented was um, some years ago, we estimated that Big Eye was, uh, um, was not in a great, great shape, the stock it was perhaps in an unhealthy state and we might wanna reduce some of the catches. And there was particularly high catches of juvenile Big Eye in the Perth Seine fishery around um, these fish aggregation devices or, or fads. Um, so the small fish accumulate around them and get caught by the Perth Seiners. So one, one management response and an example of how you might reduce the, the catches of, of small big eye is to limit the use of fads over certain months of the year. So down the bottom there, you can see um, the number of sets. Um, the number of sets that are, that, that are fished each month. So you can see big bars during most of the months and then you see a big drop off um, during a three or four month period when, when fad fishing is, is completely banned. So that's just one example, and there's, there's, there's many more in the region that we can discuss afterwards. So that's kind of a, a, an overview of the, the management advice. Um, I think we're, we'll now move on to a video, if I'm not wrong. My name is Marino Oteo Wichman and I'm from the Cook Islands and welcome to SPC. Kasselelia, my name is Nathan Bradley Phillip Jr. from Pohnpei in the Federated States of Micronesia. Hello everyone, my name is AJ Arudere and I'm from Vanuatu. My name is Jen Singh. I'm from Fiji. Kia my name is James Kora, um, I'm from the Cook Islands. I'm currently um, part of the Pacific Island Fisheries Professional Program um, based within the Statistics and Modelling Division at SBC. 
uh, part of my program uh, looks at a pretty special topic in fisheries, um, per se, effort creep. Now, effort creep is a phenomenon that's just been realised recently um, that looks at kind of the advancements in technology, um, you know, the, the crew experiences that have evolved over time, and as a result, they've um, effectively been able to catch a lot more fish. I work alongside the scientists in the fisheries ecosystem and management and analysis section, looking at bycatch studies, looking at the bycatch data from fishing gears for the person and long line gear. Bycatch including wahoo, mahi mahi, rainbow runner, pillfish, and other non tunnel target species. My engagement here is uh, under the program with SPC is in two components. So the first one is is to assist um, the member countries in development of uh, management plans, especially coastal fisheries and aquaculture management plans and policies. The second component is uh, basically to build my capacity and my knowledge and skills on the area of fisheries management and policies. I guess the favourite part so far is you know, really working with um, the scientists and working behind the scenes to see how a lot of these models are run, the complexities behind it and the hard work that really goes on and it's, I, I take credit to a lot of these, these scientists, they're world renowned, the best of their field and it's such a privilege to, to work alongside them. Oh definitely the food. I think there's a French flavour that's very present here in Numea. Uh, I love the croissants, I love the banya, the baguettes. It's not one size fits all, you know, there's experts in different fields and I'm able to uh, engage with them on a daily basis. So just absorbing and soaking up as much as I can from uh, these guys and really it's uh, upskilling my professional background. So It's not only about the work, uh, it's all about your social activity as well. So uh, one thing I would say I like most is the one small thing. Uh, I like uh, doing the, my one small thing, it's like every day I have to do my work and that is uh, balancing out work with uh, your social life. So I always look forward to the end of the work week where we have cover Fridays and we sit down with each other and just talk about life stories and work. And this is also a learning experience for me to get a better understanding of the important work the SPC staffs are doing for the SPC members. The most important one that I took out from this program is, uh, is the leadership skills. So it's not only about learning to develop policies, uh, management plans for fisheries development, but it's all about uh, leadership in fisheries sector. So that is one thing that I would take home as a key message from this program. My experience here at SPC uh, has encouraged me to further my skills in the harvest strategy approach to fisheries management. So when I go back to my country, I'm going to encourage and create awareness of the harvest strategy approach to our people and what benefits does harvest strategy approach bring to our fisheries management in long term in understanding in understanding the performance of the fishery and also maintaining our stock uh, at sustainable levels. To all my Pacific brothers and sisters and to all the future Pacific Island fisheries professionals, uh, I would strongly recommend this program uh, to my brothers and sisters out there. Stay focused on your dreams, put in the hard work and dedication and always, always be humble. SPC is very supportive uh, of you and so they'll take into account many of your uh, backgrounds or, or challenges. And there's probably no better place to be positioned than Numea for one year, so thank you. <laughs>
Uh, over to you, Sam and Marina. Uh, thanks, Shona. Um, so this is a, the last section we'll talk about. And um, I guess people that have been around the region for a while will know um, some of these um, analyses that get presented at some of these meetings and things are, are quite technical. And um, one of the important kind of roles that we have is to ensure that all our member countries um, fully comprehend what we're doing, um, the technical details, so that, they, that they're informed for their um, for the decisions they have to make on the management of the fisheries. So um, we'll just quickly present now a, a few different strands um, very briefly on, on some of the things we're doing to try and um, enhance uh, the capacity of some of our members. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sam. And uh, it's always a bit awkward when, you, when you're wearing the same shirt um, from filming maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, so thanks to you for, for that. Uh, I did want to maybe just quickly highlight some of the different types of capacity building um, initiatives and programs that SBC um, undergoes, in particular, um, some of the stock assessment workshops, the tuna data workshops um, that OFP run. And as Sam's already mentioned, these are really um, focused to ensure that uh, our national, um, that nationals from our member states are in a position where they fully understand uh, the, the complexities around a lot of these assessments, these technical papers, uh, that they're in a position where they can disseminate it and um, obviously um, translate that back to their fishery managers. Another key objective to the um, workshops that OFP provides is we, we aim to ensure that our nationals are in a position where they can effectively participate in a lot of these uh, negotiations. So there are um, a number of sub-regional committees that run um, annually, the uh, scientific committee, uh, the technical compliance committee, and of course the Tuna Commission, um, which all, all require some sort of um, technical know-how and SBC has been um, actively engaged with our member states to ensure that they're in a position where they can, um, as I said, effectively participate. Now in this uh, green table, you'll see um, the different types of capacity building initiatives that um, FAME has been um, involved with since 2016 to 2020. And, you know, it's great to see that we've had nearly over, over four and a half thousand um, participants um, which have gone through um, various different types of placements. Uh, you'll see there's workplace attachments and we saw the video previously um, where, where we had one year secondments in NSBC and it's a great opportunity for uh, our, our, our people, our member state um, officers to you know really get involved with a certain um, topic that, that might be of national importance. Uh, they can sit down with, uh, spend time with the, basically the, the experts, you know, and you're immersed um, in an environment where you can fully kind of engage in, in these topics, learn about it, and um, hopefully, you know, take, take it back home and, and obviously serve the region um, as, as you see fit. And so workplace attachments generally, um, they can range between a one week type of attachment to a one year type of attachment. They also have um, formal trainings and SBC has collaborated with a number of um, academic institutions um, and also some other uh, sub-regional bodies to develop um, certain um, teaching materials which allow participants to gain some form of uh, accreditation. And one program that comes to mind is the Pacific Island Regional uh, Fisheries Observer Program. Uh, where SBC has collaborated with the Foreign Fisheries Agency, FFA, um, and have provided a course which conformed to the standards which um, come under the Western Central Pacific Tuna Commission. And what this allows um, the participants is a pathway to um, effectively become uh, offshore observers um, within the Western Central Pacific Ocean. We also have what do we call non-accredited uh, Courses. Now, these are some of the ad hoc requests that we gen generally receive from member states. And again, this can extend to, could we have assistance in developing a fisheries management plan? Um, where can we deploy FADs? How would you conduct the beach de mer type survey? Um, and so SPC will generally tailor, tailor a program in response to these types of um, requests. And of course, because of COVID, 
we are moving um, towards, I guess, online type platforms and we're utilizing Moodle, um, which is what we've been using for uh, the stock assessment workshop. Um, another another kind of strand that that that's come up a lot recently, and many people will have heard of, is this kind of um, shift towards a different approach to managing our fisheries. Um, and you may have heard of it; that's been mentioned in some of these videos. Is this harvest strategy approach? So the traditional stock assessment um, methods, we we do an assessment, management reacts. We might do another assessment in a couple of years, and the advice might be slightly different, and, and management has to re react in another way. So this harvest strategy approach very generally is um, before any of this happens, we, we come up with some predefined rules about what might happen given a certain stock status. And when it occurs, we know exactly what's gonna happen um, as far as management interventions go. So this is a new, newish type of um, system. Um, it's, very, it's actually very complicated, the background um, maths and things. So um, it's important for members to understand this before they have to make some decisions around how this is going to be implemented. So um, one of the strands we've got going at the moment is to go into individual countries and, and hold workshops and make sure everyone's up to speed on this. And you can see um, a list of the countries up there. Um, and these guys are also developing software apps that are used to support this, um, which has been a good way for people to, to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and just uh, very quickly on this slide, um, we've already mentioned some of the collaboration that we, we've had with uh, the likes of FFA, PNA, um, and really SBC will continue to provide, you know, these training um, capacity workshops um, courses to ensure that all of our members um, obviously are in a position to effectively um, ensure that their national interests are upheld and they can effectively uh, participate in a lot of these um, meeting forums that they generally sit in um, from year to end. Um, Voila, I think we're at the end of it, guys. Um, the Pacific Island Fisheries Professional Program, well, you've seen the video. Um, great workplace-based att um, attachment. Uh, obviously, uh, I was part of it maybe two years ago, and you can see here, this was probably the last cohort of uh, island professionals um, that SPC managed to get in country in Namir. Um, and this was obviously prior to, to, to COVID hitting in 2020. And there was just, this image is just a, a, to give a flavor, I guess, of the different types of um, part participants under this program. So we got uh, Marshall Island, Samoa, Vanuatu, Fiji, uh, and the Cooks in uh, Federated States of Micronesia. So all I can say is I encourage a lot of our young professionals um, to, to please keep an eye out, um, please do apply. Um, it's a great, great um, initiative, a great learning opportunity. Um, and on that note, uh, Shona, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Marino um, and Sam for, um, you know, it's great to learn about um, SBC's capacity building programs in fisheries. And I know this is very much needed um, in the Pacific. Um, and having worked in a national fisheries agency before and noting that we typically have very limited um, resources and pools of people um, to draw on. Uh, I hate to put you on the spot, Marina, <laughs> but um, does SBC provide support to these agencies um, when their staff leave uh, to join like SBC, FFA, other regional organizations um, that, that you're aware of? Yeah, thanks, uh, Shona. Um, actually, not too sure. I mean, obviously, if it is a need a capacity gap from the national administration, they will obviously make a formal um, application to SBC. And I think from there, um, SBC will see what's within their capability to address those issues or capacity gaps. 
Mm, okay. And are there like opportunities for other early career professionals not necessarily coming through the national uh, fisheries agencies um, to perhaps also build their capacity in fisheries or data science with SBC? And I know because I'm speaking for myself, um, you know, after leaving um, fisheries and, you know, uh, developing my own um, sort of co-founding our own uh, data company, working in fisheries and agriculture. But I'm always looking for opportunities to like kind of expand my knowledge and um, experience within fisheries. Um, and I know there are others um, sim in sort of like similar situation. So it would be interesting to, to see whether there are opportunities for those that are not necessarily from like national fisheries. Um, yeah, I'll take this question. We um because we are this uh, little uh, laboratory where we conduct a number of, of studies and experiments, uh, it's a great platform for uh, teaching and for learning. And so we're trying to have uh, students. So we are not a university, so we cannot uh, conduct uh, um, um, graduation programs, but we can participate by having uh, students coming over to conduct part of their studies and, and things like that. Um, it has obviously been super challenging in the past two years. Basically, nobody could travel around. So, um, but um, it's definitely something that we would like to uh, to have uh, yeah, more Pacific Islanders participating too. So maybe um, trying to have um, students from, uh, for example, the USPs and the University of South Pacific in Fiji, or uh, there are a number of, of universities in Papua New Guinea too, where we could have uh, students coming over for, uh, for some periods of time to to learn um, things. So um, there's potentially opportunities. There is no formal program, but um, mm. yeah, it's basically uh, for, uh, for people to contact us. And sometimes we also um, send uh, internship uh, announcement on, on the SPC website so people can, uh, can answer to that. Yeah, Chad? Yeah. Um... I'd like to add as well that, yes, there are several things involved with the Pacific Marine Specimen Bank where we actually have active collaborations um, mm -hmm. with different universities or other research agencies pretty much globally now. Um, so there's just through having the access to samples that all researchers can access those samples um, through a request made to the, um, the commission. And so in a way that allows SBC to be engaged um, yeah, more broadly with students, particularly, um, because mm -hmm. many, many, many people who make those requests are, uh, you know, doing their undergraduate studies or postgrad studies at different universities. So um, I think that's a nice aspect of the tissue bank as well. It is, yeah, definitely. Um, well, thank you all so much, um, Marino, Sam, Valerie, and Jed, for um, enlightening us today with the the amazing work that you're all doing at SBC in helping to ensure the um, sustainability um, and, and management of our um, tuna resources in the region. Um, this brings us to our Q&A session. Um, I'd just like to, again, remind everyone that uh, this session will be, uh, because it's recorded, will be made available by SBC and also be used by the UN Ocean Decade Lab later. Um, if you have any questions, I've seen uh, a couple of questions come through on the chat. Um, please feel free to uh, post it in the chat, or if you'd like to ask it verbally, um, just grab my attention by, you know, using the raise your hand icon, and then I will uh, give you the floor. Um, but just to, there was a, a question, if I could start with that, that just that came through. Um, about stock assessments and whether these are carried out for individual member countries or is it grouped by regions? Uh, so this is someone that came in a bit later after the stock assessment bit. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's a good question. And um, unfortunately, um, when, we, when, we do, when we do run a stock assessment, it's for the whole region. And so nearly all our assessments are for the Western and Central Pacific. And, um, you know, depending on the species, how, how, how far that um, expa extends, um, you know, can be different for different species. 
Um, yeah. And then one thing we often have to do or we get requests from countries is to kind of um, give them individual advice or interpret that as far as, um, you know, their individual EZ is concerned. And we can do that to a degree, you know, there's, there's information in the stock assessment um, that we can apply to, to the EZ, you know, kind of um, rough estimates of um, how their catches and things compare to the biomass in their regions. But um, these stock assessments are kind of most robust at the at the large regional scale. If you go to um, into a too confined kind of spatial area, they become less and less reliable. Um, mm -hmm. But then we also have, or um, well, these guys have a, a a kind of parallel program. This this program called um, Sepidim, which looks at very fine scale um, information about stock status. So that has been used in the past. Um, for certain species, um, if, a, if a certain country wants, um, you know, country specific information. But yeah, it's certainly something that crops up a lot. And um, mm -hmm. it, it's also something that in the future you could see becoming um, more and more reliable or so, like a, a kind of work in progress, I guess, mm -hmm. particularly surrounding um, climate change and shifts in the distribution of fish. And these things become um, really, really um, important. Mm, okay. Um, okay, so we have a, a, another question. Well, someone showed interest in, in the capacity building program and had commented, but I think this question is very similar to what I had asked about how does SBC select participants um, from its member countries to participate in the capacity building program, whether it specifically focuses on fisheries personnel or, um, you know, it's open to anyone interested in, in fisheries? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, so no, maybe I can take that one. Um, I, I guess it depends on the type of workshop that's been offered. Generally, it's up to the national administrations to uh, nominate their, their personnel or whoever they, they want to um, participate in a um, specific workshop. There are certain programs like the uh, Pacific Professionals Program where it is a um, competitive type of um, tender, I guess, um, course where you need to apply, uh, you are vetted and you go through an interview process and it is the, the best candidate that is selected. So yeah, it, it does depend on the type of workshop that's um, generally being offered. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, so Chloe uh, had me has mentioned uh, that um, WCPFC stocks are all in the green compared to other tuna stocks um, in other parts of the world, I guess in other RFMOs. Uh, what would you say the harvest uh, strategy progress is when compared to other um, tuna stock, global tuna stocks? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question, and I, I don't think anyone on this panel is um, an expert in the harvest strategy work, but um, we, we might be able to fundle, fumble our way through it, but um, I know that the, there are other stocks around the world that have probably progressed further in this than we have, um, certainly in some of the other oceans, the Indian Ocean, I think a couple of their species are they're much further along than we are. Um, so it's definitely a work on for the region, but um, I, I think there are reasons why it might be difficult in our region more than some others, um, just from the sheer number of, of parties or stakeholders involved with some of these stocks that are shared over, you know, 20, 20 or more countries, whereas um, in some of the other oceans, there's a lot of high seas, um, not an awful lot of EZs, it's, it's possibly easier. Mm. Um, so I think, we, I, I think we are behind some. Um, mm -hmm. but, but then perhaps more advanced in some as well. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see over the next few years. I mean, the, the next year or two, um, there's very ambitious goals about what, what will happen with the harvest strategies in the region. So whether they can, can be met will be interesting to see. Okay. Um, Moses in the chat has just asked if there are opportunities for member countries to build capacity to carry out their own assessments while working with SBC. Um, and I think that's something that has already been um, covered by Marino and Sam about the capacity building programs that they have, um, where they assist uh, the member countries um, 
in building the capacity of their people to be able to understand and um, uh, help out with those assessments. But uh, Sam and Marino, if you'd like to add some more, then. Yeah, sure. And um, and yeah, hi, Moses as well. Um, yeah, we haven't, I, I wouldn't say we've done anything specific for, for individuals and in countries. Um, for them to actually run their own assessments. Um, I mean, we have worked with people individually and countries individually and had people here to, to um, kind of build their capacity. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say we're, and it's quite a difficult un undertaking. I mean, there's a, they are, it is complicated. Um, I, I wouldn't say we've ever gone through the process of, of doing a full um, stock assessment like we would carry out for a country but at the same time we have helped with people that that will use the stock assessment or or something similar to to come up with something for the individual EZs um, particularly like bioeconomic type stuff to determine kind of how many vessels they should have in their EZ um, but there's no reason why it couldn't happen but I think it would be um, it would be it'd be um, yeah there'd be a lot of work involved with that um, just, I think I'll take a couple more questions, uh, just a couple more questions before we wrap up, uh, just uh, being mindful of the time. Um, so one of the questions from the registrations was, uh, what is the science behind setting target reference points? Um, would anyone like to give that a go? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess, first of all, um, we probably should say what a target reference point is for, 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 these, for, the, for the audience. But um, so a target reference point is basically a, a point or a, a level of the stock that um, you, want, um, you want the stock to be at to achieve all, all the objectives of your fishery. So um, it might be that you want a stock at a certain level so that you can make enough money to, to support your country you have enough food for, um, you know, for sustenance for people that rely on it. Um, and you, there might be kind of ecosystem benefits of having it at a, at a certain level as well. So it's where you want to be. Um, and so until you define all those objectives, um, you don't, you know, you can't really define exactly where, where you want it to be. Um, but we do, we have in the past, and, and now we, there is a few stocks where there is, this has been kind of, um, defined for 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 the region um, and there'll be a certain I guess um, biomass level or a, a, a level of the stock where we want to be and it's been determined based on these types of things and some of them might be um, we want the stock to be a certain level because we meet all these objectives and into the future we think fishing at this level um, won't have a huge amount of risk to, to ongoing sustainability we should be able to keep um, harvesting in the way that we have. So that's kind of um, a rough, rough example of, of what a target reference point might be and how you might set it. Thanks, Sam. Um, okay, and so just uh, quickly, uh, if I one sentence in one sentence each um, <laughs> for early career professionals and aspiring scientists that have uh, joined us today or will be watching this recording later. Uh, what piece of advice would you give them um, that you wish someone had given you as you were just starting out your career? Um, so in one sentence, I know it's hard, but <laughs> we're running ahead of time. <laughs> and start with Marino. <laughs> yeah, I always get the easy ones. Um, oh, really, I, I think the sky's the limit. You really don't know unless you, you, you're out there and you're doing it. Um, and it's very much what I've kind of learned throughout my career, um, learning as you do. Um, so, yeah, I, I encourage you on to con continue to pursue um, your, your dreams and your aspirations and um, all the best. That's, uh, that might be the longest sentence I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Um, I know, right? From you, Sam. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess I would just say that, that there are a huge number of opportunities. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> Are we sure to send this then? <laughs> um, yeah, I would yeah, encourage people to uh, just experience as much as they can, uh, meeting people, exchanging ideas and, uh, and, and experiences and, and just yeah, opening your mind and, and um, see, see what's out there. That's, uh, that's important. Yeah, and building on all of these, these sentences, um, I think one key thing I would recommend is just being creative, trying to think outside the square a little bit and be willing to take a few risks, move around a bit, um, put yourself outside your comfort zone. I think that can lead to some insights um, in work and life. Thank you. Thank you for those um the uh, nuggets of gold you, you shared with all of us uh, today. Um, and if I may ask Pierre, before we forget that, you know, Tui has been uh, busy scribbling away um, what he thought about our session today, um, if you could uh, put that up. All right. looking like a fish. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, we have a couple of uh, time lapses from Tui. <laughs> masses of the tuniverse yes we've just heard from them today <laughs> i have a feeling this one is going to be an interesting one <laughs> Some of us need, definitely need some tagging. <laughs> and our final clip. <laughs> All right, data entry, yes. Thank you, Tui, for adding some humor to today's um, session. Did it take off? <laughs> Steve says, love the cartoon, Tui. Yeah. <laughs> all right well well thank you all so much um for joining us today and especially to our speakers um i do want to highlight just a few uh takeaways uh for from this uh, session um and that is that you know tuna is important for the pacific and accounts for more than 50 percent of our global tuna supply and this is an important industry for many Pacific Islands um, as it keeps people employed and generates revenue. Um, and that, you know, understanding the tuna science is critical for the proper management of our shared tuna resources. And that a key part of understanding the science is having access to good data. Um, and which, you know, scientists and fisheries managers can use this data to help 
understand how fish populations react to different um, uh, well, to fishing activity as well as environmental stresses like climate change, pollution, and uh, predation, and also helps in um, to better monitor, assess, and manage uh, our stocks for long-term benefits. Um, and without the strong regional cooperation we have in the Pacific to manage this tuna resource, you know, SBC's work to understand the science and provide good advice um, to countries would be much more uh, difficult to do. Um, and, and then more importantly, you know, SBC isn't just giving back good advice on tuna based, uh, uh, based on science, but it's also helping to build the capacities of our fisheries professionals in the region, uh, making sure they're equipped with the knowledge uh, right skills and tools they'll need to help uh, their countries better manage uh, this very important resource. Um, and this capacity building is essential for the future of our uh, tuna fishery, as individually, most Pacific Island countries are small and have very limited resources. Um, I thank you all once again, especially to our speakers uh, for sharing with us their wealth of knowledge, um, and experiences um, about the work that they're doing at OFP, um, uh, as well as, you know, SBC in general for the amazing um, work they're doing uh, with the help of their members and partners uh, in sustainably uh, managing um, uh, this very important uh, resource for our Blue Pacific, um, which, you know, as, uh, we like to, to um, just, yeah, thank you again, everyone and our participants for joining us online. Um, this session will be made available um, as well as all the cartoons that uh, Tui had uh, written up for us um, and will be made available online. I also thank the organizers uh, for this, uh, putting together this wonderful um, program and for having me to be your moderator for today. Um, and that brings us to the end of our session. Kafatayalava, and thank you very much. Thanks, Shona. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.